is Luke Imhoff. Uh, I'm the maintainer of the IntelliJ Elixir plugin for uh, JetBrains IDEs, which include RubyMind uh, and IntelliJ itself, but also WebStorm and a whole plethora of IDEs right now. Um, I've contributed to the Elixir standard library and found bugs in the native tokenizer and parser through my work on IntelliJ Elixir, and I help run the Austin Elixir meetup here in town. Uh, for viewers that want to follow along now or uh, once it's on YouTube, this presentation itself is on my GitHub Pages site. Um, you can see the source for it and the source for the project itself. Does anyone need to copy that down before I move on? You good? Okay. Uh, th this is going to be the process of how I introduce features uh, to IntelliJ itself. Um, I'm not going to mention which version stuff was in exactly, mostly because I had to skip, uh, skip around a lot uh, to make this fit in the time, but it's somewhat in timeline order. Uh, people may wonder why I took it upon myself to make an IDE plugin for Elixir when I could have just used a Vim or Emacs plugin. There's Alchemist after all. It's great. Uh, I've used both Emacs and Vim. Uh, I started with Emacs when I worked at Cray, only switched into Vim when I needed something that, that worked over a high latency, low, low bandwidth CDMA modem uh, on the highway when I was uh, working during road trips. Uh, I started using RubyMind when my boss at a previous job, Nicholas Cancellari, introduced me to it. I was shocked that an IDE for a dynamic language like Ruby could support find usage, go to definition, and refactor. I had been used to using CTAGs for Vim, so this change that a dynamic language could be understood by an IDE was mind-blowing. I haven't completely abandoned my usage of Vim. Uh, I still use uh, Vim with the Vim Elixir plugin from the command line. I also use all the the Vim stuff from tpope to get syntax highlighting when I need to edit configuration files and that sort of thing. But without RubyMind, I don't think I would be as good of a Ruby developer as I am now. I use the debugger in RubyMind to understand uh, the, how the DSLs are implemented for Active Record um, and for the router in Rails. Um, I also wouldn't have been able to understand the Metasploit Ruby code base, like a legacy project with eight years and not software engineering practices, like RubyMind still understands the code even if the code isn't written well. And so I want that power in Elixir. I didn't think we would have bad code, but I just knew that the reason why JetBrains can have so many languages, uh, IDEs, is because they figured out how to do that stuff like refactoring and find usage and go to declaration. So it's just part of the API and it's not language specific. So if I could teach the JetBrains API, how to understand Elixir, I could get all those cool features for free. However, just getting the syntax and lexine parsing right ended up taking a year. It was exactly one year between the initial commit of the project skeleton and the version 1.0 tag. Um, until I wrote this presentation, I didn't actually know that. That was a complete fluke, that it was exactly one year. One of the standard ways of defining a syntax is in BNF, or Beckus nor form, or Beckus normal form, but people argue that's not normal form, so call it, don't call it that, which was first used for the Agile 60 standard, which by its name was in 1960. Both YEC and GrammarKit use a form of BNF, so I assumed it was just a matter of porting the elixir.yrl to elixir.bnf. YEC is a parser generator written in Erlang and a and part of the standard distribution that is based on YAC uh, with an A instead of an E, which is a parser generator written in C that a lot of people are used to using um, when they're doing C-based implementations of new languages. The YAC syntax differs from BNF in that it uses a skinny arrow instead of colon colon equals, and instead of using pipe for or, lines with the same rule name are repeated with alternative uh, definitions. So all those grammar rules, all those lines are actually or together here. Uh, finally, uh, YEC supports uh, running Erlang code on the tokens using dollar number for positional references the same way we would do with um, in regular expressions. Uh, dollar empty is a special token that matches no input. In formal grammars, this usually re is referred to as lowercase epsilon, which is kind of the curly E if you look at it in Wikipedia. Uh, GrammarKit is a parser generator written in Java and created by JetBrains. Uh, it's actually maintained by some of the people that maintain the IntelliJ Erlang plugin. 
Grammar Kit's BNF format does use colon colon equals like Bacchus and form, but it has more powerful constructs uh, above just pipe for or. It contains the, um, the tools that we'd expect from extended regular expressions like question mark, parentheses, um, clean star, um, being able to do a group that matches nothing using question mark or star, or even um, having nothing after colon colon equals. Unlike YEC, there is no Java code embedded directly in the grammar, um, but uh, Java code can be attached by, uh, by saying that a given node implements a given interface or extends a, a given interface or a class. But it does mean that since there isn't raw code processing the match tokens, that the AST is whatever the grammar says it is. There's no manipulating the AST like you can do in YEC. Uh, so this is good because the AST is just there, um, but it's bad that there isn't direct control over it. So it's a balance. Yak and Grammar Kit both support a form of BNF, and Grammar Kit seems like it would support even more compact grammars because question mark, star, pipe, and parentheses could eliminate some of the redundancies needed in multi-clause rules in Yak. So after only six days, I had quote unquote translated the BNF from Yak to Grammar Kit and ended up with a parser that froze the I IDE, uh, which uh, Julius Hack Beckman, who maintains the awesome Elixir list, was thankfully reported to me because my test cases at the time didn't freeze because I wasn't actually running them on like realistic projects. Um, so this left the slow process of translating the grammar correctly over the next 359 days. Uh, at the time of the freeze, I didn't really understand why directly transliterating from one BNF format to the other didn't work. I thought BNF is BNF. Why didn't it work? So I went back and actually started to do the JetBrains tutorial step by step instead of jumping ahead. And I searched Wikipedia, trying to find CompSci articles that explain the correct way to do this. Uh, in order to support color syntax highlighting and to mark syntax errors with a nice red squiggly underline, IntelliJ Elixir need to be able to analyze Elixir syntax. Syntactic analysis is usually broken down uh, into two parts. First, the raw text is turned into tokens. So instead of having individual characters, you group words together. Um, and second, those tokens uh, have to be checked that they're arranged in the correct order, which is normally referred to as parsing. Um, in most programming languages, both lexers and parsers are built using generators that have an external DSL. So we always refer to DSLs in Ruby and Elixir, but technically those are internal DSLs because they're written in the programming language you're already in. There's also the concept of external DSLs, where you need something to parse the raw text, and you might have embedded code in it. Um, I suppose you could almost say EEX is an external DSL in that sense, uh, but it's not usually referred that way. Uh, in Elixir, the Elixir is built using Erlang uh, directly because Erlang pattern matching is compact enough that a generator is not necessary. Additionally, the Elixir syntax contains some features that a normal Elixir generator uh, just wouldn't expect to be able to handle. For IntelliJ Elixir, I used JFlex because it was the Elixir generator recommended by the JetBrains plugin tutorial. Which I will say, the plugin tutorial is super helpful, but the language is really, really simple. So it's not helpful in the end. And I had to look at a lot of open source plugins to try to understand how to implement real language features. For uh, parsing Elixir, the Elixir uses YEC, as I mentioned, to actually generate Erlang code that then does the parsing. For IntelliJ Elixir, I use JetBrains Grammar Git, which will generate Java. Uh, IntelliJ itself is written in Java. Um, when I first started working on this, you know, on like day seven, I didn't really understand the difference between the generators. Uh, I thought it was mostly like just a choice the two communities had made, uh, but there are very important differences. The first step of syntactic analysis is lexing, also referred to as tokenizing. Uh, lexing breaks up the raw text into tokens such as keywords, literals, operators, or identifiers. Uh, Input is matched using some pattern. In native Elixir, this pattern matching is using Erlang string prefixes. So in Elixir, we'd call them careless. But it's just the norm pa normal pattern ma matching we're used to looking at in function definitions. In IntelliJ Elixir, JFlex is file. It's just regular expressions. So both can ignore characters. Um, in Erlang, uh, comments are ignored by just, we're not going to include it in the uh, tokenized Field. In JFlex, though, I have to output a comment token 
because it's an editor. You, ha you care where the cursor is. So every piece of text has to be represented in IntelliJ. I can't just say, ignore that bit. Um, for EOLs, um, we have to handle both Windows line ending and um, Linux and Mac line ending. Um, in the native Elixir parser, their own, lines are only really kept track of to say that the line is incremented for the metadata, but I have to keep track of them. Um, I can keep track of them as white space, but I still need to then filter out that white space before doing the parsing step for the same reasons of it's an editor, you have to know where the cursor is. So the first like hard feature I implemented was interpolation. Before I did interpolation, I also did simple stuff like just parsing um, base integers, which is you know binary, hex, and um, octal numbers. But that's not terribly interesting, so we're going to cover interpolation first. Adding support for interpolation was tricky. Um, at first glance, the hash curly brace and closing curly brace that surround interpolation should work just like curly braces in a language like C or Java. Uh, but braces in C or Java can be lexed, and then the parser can decide whether they are matched. In languages like Ruby or Elixir that support interpolation, whether you're parsing fragments of a string and like everything is just a literal string, just take whatever you see, um, or if you're in normal code, totally matters. Um, Additionally, the interpolation can be nested an infinite, to an infinite depth. There's no limitation in the native Elixir parser for like, oh, you've in, you're nested five levels deep with interpolation. You can't do that. Um, I did notice that I want to say that one of the Emacs plugins actually doesn't do infinite nesting, so mine's better. Um, uh, so you can almost think about like when you enter the the hash curly braces, it's almost like entering into a new file of Elixir. So almost the way like include works in C. This uh, recursion means that the non-deterministic finite automaton that JFlex generates by default can't actually parse Elixir. So what is, what is that gibberish I just said? Uh, a finite automaton, also known as a finite state machine, can only lex regular languages. Um, which match formal regular expressions. Formal regular expressions aren't actually the regular expressions we're used to using. So formal regular expressions can have or, they can have parentheses, they can have uh, the asterisk, which is formally called a clean star, um, they can have question mark, but they can't have back references and they can't have non-greedy matchers um, because it actually blows up the computational complexity to support those features. And unfortunately, in order to get recursive regular expressions, you need back references. The context-free languages that um, are slightly above what a finite state machine can parse um, can be lexed by what's called a pushdown automaton, which is just a finite state machine that also has a stack. So every transition state can be decided on, I'm in this state, what's at the top of the stack? And you can use that to match um, things that need to be recursive, like matching parentheses, because to match parentheses, you do an open one, you push on the stack, you see a closing one, you push it, you pop it off the stack. If your stack is ever unbalanced, so you have too many opening parentheses on the stack, or you, ha or you try to pop one when the stack is empty, you know the parentheses or braces are unbalanced. Um, the reason you have to care about computational complexity with your parsers and lexers is finite automata have a bounded time. Usually they're some fixed constant times the size of the input. But if you get to Turing machines, most of us heard of the halting problem. Like it is undecidable how bad it's going to be when there's bad input. And in an IDE, when you're typing, just by definition, as you type the code, you're going to keep hitting bad input and you don't want the IDE to freeze the first time you say n instead of end. That'd be horrible. In native Elixir, Elixir tokenizer's tokenize call calls handle strings, which calls Elixir interpolation's extract method, which calls Elixir tokenizer's tokenize, means that every interpolation you call is just normal Erlang uh, recursion. So the Erlang stack is what handles recursion. And it's also a case statement, so it's not tail recursive. So in theory, you could blow it up, but I couldn't actually make it blow up. I'm not really sure why, but I did 10 minutes 
10 million levels, and it didn't blow up. Yeah. <laughs> JFlex is um, Flex DSL only supports creating finite automaton, like I said. So I had to use the actual literal definition of a pushdown automaton and add a manually managed stack in Java um, that I would manage uh, with with the actual uh, Java code that's executed for each regular expression in order to emulate recursion. Which I'm sure we've all done that before in college. We're like, here, you can only do it iteratively. You know it has to be a recursive solution, so that's fake a stack. So if the Luxor hits a non-escape double quote, it enters double quote string state, which treats the, uh, the hash uh, curly brace uh, as a start of interpolation, which kicks it into the interpolation state. But before entering the interpolation, it records the state it came from by pushing that state onto the stack. Interpolation only differs from the normal top-level body of the code in that interpolation treats the closing curly brace special to pop the stack and go back to wherever you came from, which could be more interpolation or to the root body state. The first uh, like useful expressions I could do after strings were what the parser calls matched expressions. But first, we need to cover associativity. So associativity is how to group repeat operations of the same uh, precedence. I'm using the OR operator and the word, the OR operators that are the word OR and the double pipes for, for the left associated operator because they're easy to distinguish. Similarly, I'm using the what are called two operators, which are just operators that have that are two wide. <laughs> it's kind of a weird name. Um, so double plus and uh, Diamond, so uh, list concatenation and uh, string concatenation for the right associative operators. So the operators are of the same precedence, and it's just the associativity that um, changed the nesting. For left associative, the leftmost operator becomes the root of the tree, with the right operand executing first. So it looks like the operators are in the wrong order when you look at the nesting. But if you rearrange it into uh, pipeline order, you see that it actually executes in the order that you typed it. For right associative, reading the tree looks in order, but when you rearrange it to pipeline order, you can see that it actually gets rearranged. Furthering our knowledge of the background, I'll cover the different grammars uh, that I learned that the uh, two systems use. Yuck is a LA, LR, or a look ahead, left to right, rightmost derivation. So the look ahead is the LA, the Left to right is just the L, not the LR part. And the R is rightmost derivation. So this is one of those acronyms where they leave off important parts. <laughs> and then parts of, and parts of the acronym look like they mean other parts of the actual expanded form. Uh, grammar kit is a parsing expression grammar, which is from the family of uh, left to right, leftmost derivation parsers, and also um, recursive descent parsers. Uh, rightmost derivation means that the parse tree is actually built up from the very rightmost end of the text. So it actually looks like it's building up the parse tree by reading backwards. Um, rightmost uh, derivation is also usually uh, done bottom up from like tokens will be assembled into rules. Those rules will be greater rules. While leftmost derivation starts from the very beginning of the text, the way we, the text is actually read. And you start with, I'm going to try to match the entire file at once. Well, matching the file means these pieces, and so it's broken up, and so that's top down. You can technically do rightmost derivation and do top down, but it makes the stack explode, so no one really does it that way. Importantly, um, the section where it says left recursion, right recursion, Rightmost derivation favors left recursion because it means the recursion happens at the end. Since the rules are actually read backwards, left recursion by having the recursive rule as the first rule you read means that actually rightmost derivation hits it last. And so it's good there. And it's actually the favored way to write rules because it keeps the stack really small. Um, but in leftmost derivation, that rule that's on the left is hit first. And so it ends up not, nothing actually gets consumed. You just hit the recursive loop, and you never eat any input. So in a basic parsing expression grammar, 
all the rules have to be rewritten to, do, to eliminate that left recursion. And unfortunately, this is one of those things in computer science where there's a proof that there is no general way to do this by machine. There are heuristics for humans to do, um, but you can't machine optimize it to do it for you. So now that we know about associativity, uh, let's look at how YEC does it. The YEC format has a section for declaring both the associativity and precedence of operators. The operator table doesn't completely reflect the precedence of all the operators um, because some of the precedences get swapped in the Erlang helper code like so that we can say not in to mean not in the thing so that the not applies to the in and not to the entire expression. Um, the weird non-ASOC is for non-associative operators, which usually applies to the prefix operators, um, like the ampersand for capture, or unary operators, like plus to make something positive and minus to make something negative, or just uh, exclamation point and the word not for not. Higher precedence operators with a greater number in the table can act as arguments to lower precedence operators, so that like factors or multiplications are arguments to addition. There isn't a unified associativity and precedence table for grammar kits BNF. Instead, the precedence uh, is ordered choice. So in a parsing expression grammar, the or isn't try all these options and pick the best one. It actually means try them in this order, even though they use pipe the same way regular expressions does, which is slightly confusing. So the, the precedence is here just by the order you list them which is the same order from the previous slide. Instead of stating the precedence of the operators, it's just the, pre the precedence of the operators, this is the precedence of the operations. So you can see here, this is the entire operations with both operands, not the individual like plus and minus signs. The pattern for binary operations are matched expression on either side of the operator as operands. Uh, left associativity is assumed by default, so right associativity is indicated in the rule options in curly braces, which is right associative equals true. Is it possible to zoom this up? Uh, so this entire presentation, I've cranked the font size as much as it'll go inside of Reveal.js. I'm sorry if it's too small. Um, you may have noticed the rules appear recursive because there's match expression as the leftmost operand, and I just said that's going to blow up. Um, but all these operations uh, work because of an extension that GrammarKit gives me. The rules for parsing expression grammars say that left recursion is possible, but if you declare the oper rules to extend the root expression grammar, as I'm doing in the video, with uh, an extends directive, magic occurs, and left recursion is OK. And I do say magic occurs because when it works, it works. And when it doesn't, I just get warnings. Because it's complained about left recursion. And since it's recursion, it can't actually say that this rule here, you forgot to do extends on. Because at any point, since it's recursive, it could sample the stack and be like, well, these are messed up. So if I mistype a rule name for extends, or I um, forget to say extends, all of a sudden, the, the magical parse, uh, Pratt parsing that makes left recursion OK will just disappear, and I'll get the IDE frozen again. So most of my time, when I was talking to Jose at conferences about I can't get to work, it was this. So once I trigger Pratt parsing, I get this really nice and understandable code. Uh, so it's, it's so nice, it actually tells me how each operator is understood and the uh, precedence order. So Pratt parsing is an extension of recursive descent parsers, which include the parsing expression grammars. That allows for optimization of uh, operator parsing by noticing that the pattern that most humans would do to remove left recursion and write um, operator tables can actually be done by a machine. So like this is one of those things where like hard computer science will say there's no general solution, but there turns out that there's like 
a non-general solution that works really well for a subset of the problem that we actually care about. The optimization involves noticing that eventually all the operation rules uh, get to rules that aren't left recursive because they're either tokens or they're prefix operations. And that way we can eliminate left recursion by looking for those rules. So here we can first parse the, un the prefix operators, unary operation and add operation, or the identifier expressions or the access expression because they're just tokens. Once some of the input is consumed, we then go into the match expression underscore zero function that does the actual magic of Pratt parsing. The pattern used uh, in match expression and max expression zero is from Douglas Crockford's top-down operator precedence parsing implementation in JavaScript. So that was a blog post from 2007. Grammar Kit was written, I think, about like three years ago, and then that jumps all the way back to the Pratt parsing paper in the 70s. So there's the, these big gaps between people coming up with new parsers, and so it's very hard to Google for these results. In the actual code, G is the right binding power of the currently matched operator. Only operators with a stronger binding power, because they are higher precedence, can match when recursing. But if a stronger rule is matched on the recursive call to match expression, then the while loop allows for matching operators of equal right binding power. The left associative in match at the beginning and the or expression at the end uh, each follow the pattern of when you call recursively, you call with the same G that you're testing for, but since it's G less than six, when you pass six, that means you can't match that same operator. This ensures that adjacent left operators at the same level are matched by the while loop so that they are actually parsed as siblings in the tree. And the left directive at the very top where it says marker m equals actually rearranges the tree similar to how the Elixir pipelines are rearranged. For right associative operators like win, type, pipe, and match, the if clauses recursively call match expression with the same value of g so that the recursive call can match the same operation. And since the recursion happens so that the, well, let me do it right for the camera. So it happens on the right side, so it turns out that the grouping is just right associative by default from the recursion. The first calls I implemented were no parentheses function calls. And that was just a matter of that no parens expression was the first call I hit in the top level expert rule in the yak grammar. I knew from using Elixir that these rules had to match no uh, parentheses list calls that I was used to writing. So even at first that I couldn't understand this very complicated grammar, I knew what the code had to look like eventually in a proper Elixir. When converting the yuck BNF to grammar BNF, I need to combine clauses using extra features available in the parsing expression grammar. Uh, this also helps me reason about the rules as parsing expression grammars have more regular expression syntax. And as weird as it is now to think that I can think in regular expressions, it's just true. Uh, mostly because, because it gets rid of the redundancy, it's much easier to see the branch point where a decision has to be made. So here I'm taking the duplicative rules and then combine them together. But then I hit the problem uh, at line three that the match expression grammar, in order to be optional, has to be in an anonymous group. And the, the way that GrammarKit makes Pratt parsers, you can't actually put, um, you can't put match expression in a subgroup because it won't work anymore. It has to be a direct child. So this meant that for a long time, I couldn't figure out how to make this work with Pratt. So I decided instead to break it up into two different sections. I'd make the unqualified calls, which only need an identifier, the direct uh, child of expressions. And that way I avoid the need for the Pratt parser to understand them. For qualified calls, I can just make that a call operation in match expression, and so it can use the entire match expression as a potential um, name for the function calls. So this could handle remote function calls with aliases and local function calls with just a, uh, with like off of brackets or um, dotted off of a map. 
to actually do the arguments, um, instead of having the four clauses, if you look at the actual YEC code, three of those clauses are just there to throw errors. So I didn't want to have to do special error handling for all three of them. I wanted to combine them. So I made a no parentheses strict rule in uh, the Java code so that I could search for it and actually use some of the JetBrains API power for the first time, which allowed me to add an inspection to mark the error and a quick fix. So instead of immediately throwing an error the way uh, code.stringdecoder does in Elixir, I can just mark it with the inspection as an error. And then if the user goes over it and hits Alt-Enter, I can automatically fix it for them. Being able to correct errors is one of the reasons that an IDE's grammar can be more permissive than a compiler's grammar. Permissiveness in the parser itself allows for more robust heuristics to mark the errors later. For valid arguments, call args, no parens, many, three clauses are just a way of saying there needs to be at least two arguments. And they can have keywords, but if you have one argument that's positional, the other one must be keyword. Each argument is a call args no parens expression. There are a lot of comments here because I kept screwing it up. Uh, most importantly, uh, I had the a bug was I had to put the look ahead of not keyword pair colon after match expression because match expressions can also be keyword pair keys, which I'll explain here. Match expression contains access expression. Access expression contains string line. But a st string line, but a string or a care list is contained in quoted, which is contained in keyword key, which is contained in no parentheses keyword pair, which is contained in no parentheses keywords, which is the tail of no parentheses call. So I'm now eight steps removed recursively. And remember, most studies say five to nine pieces of content you can keep in your head at one time. So this would keep happening where I'd add new rules, and I'd totally miss the recursive implications of the grammar. And it would all blow up and be like, great, why did this happen? The, the native parser doesn't have this problem because it actually tokenizes uh, quoted keyword key atoms as keyword identifiers, because unlike flex, um, the Erlang code can just hold on to text until it knows how to identify it correctly. With flex, I have to, if I have text, I have to name it as a token or put it back on for someone else to call it a token. I can't just um, build up text. Adding no parentheses function calls on their own was simple enough, but getting the no parentheses calls as the rightmost operand and only the rightmost operand in a match expression took up the majority of version 0.2.1. For a long time, I was stuck on how to ensure that a no parentheses expression would only appear on the right-hand side. Because if you think about it, you can only have no parentheses at the very end when we write code. Um, because otherwise, you'd have two no parentheses calls next to each other, and that would be an error. And the actual Yet grammar says that, like, makes it very clear that you can't do that. And the issue kept being that the automatic error handling built into the Pratt parser um, would match too early and would like not parse the comma, and then would blow up with like, why is there a comma just sitting there? What finally cracked the problem was when I realized that the no parentheses calls, by their very nature, would consume function calls to the right of the first no parentheses function call as either a positional argument or um, if it was buried in a keyword key, it would just look as a keyword key value. So it's not actually that difficult to parse. But for the longest time, I was hung up on how Yek did it. And so I didn't step back and think about how the code would actually work. Using the precedence rules for Pratt parsers, any earlier choice, any earlier choice in the or, ordered choice ors can choose a later choice as a substitution for the base rule. So starting with a subset of the rules, including dot and alias, the alias is substituted into the lower precedence dot operation because lower precedence operations wrap higher precedence operators. Think additions taking multiplications as arguments. On the right-hand operand, match call operation is substituted 
which can be expanded to another matched expression, which can be an identifier, which finally matches a remote call like kernel.inspect with no parentheses, taking a range, and a keyword arguments structs as false. Through part of version 0.2.1, I had to manually compare the PSI format output by test cases for IntelliJ Elixir and the output of code.string to quoted in IEX. Is that easy to compare the quoted form to the PSI tree as shown? So I normally had to indent the quoted form to match the PSI tree. I'd have to do this anytime I changed the nesting of the grammar, such as when introducing new error handling or making some nodes private so they didn't appear in the final tree because the JetBrains uh, GrammarKit API emphasizes don't put nodes in the tree that aren't necessary for understanding the code because it just will bloat the memory. So right now looking at that, can, can anyone tell me if those match? <laughs> yeah, so the, the issue is, is that the actual, the match operator equals is in the middle where it contains inline and not at the top like it is in the final quoted form. So I don't always have to make these translations in my head back and forth, and it's doable. But it's really, really frustrating when you get like over 100 tests to have to do it for everyone to make sure there's not a slight error in the associativity rules and so on. IntelliJ's SDK is written in Java, and I knew I could use Java to talk to Erlang through J interface. So I decided to just have J interface tell me if the PSI was correct by, by having each PSI element in the tree respond to a quote method, which would spit out the J interface objects that match the output from code.string to quoted. The first step in using JInterface for creating a Java node is using OTP node. The first argument is the node name, and the second argument is the cookie. The local and remote names are very close. The Java node is using a dash, while the Elixir node is using an underscore. Once you have a node, you need a PID to send to the Elixir code so it can talk back to you, but Java doesn't have processes. Instead, they have a mailbox, and you can ask that's PID. Um, Java doesn't have pattern matching, so when you receive, you just get the first message that's there, um, but thankfully, I didn't actually have to worry about messages I couldn't match, so I could just call receive. At the time, I hadn't seen Joe DeVivo's talk on uh, Gen Java, so I wasn't sure how to fake a Gen server call format, so I just used the map. IntelliJ Elixir is very simple. It's just a supervised Gen server that takes a quote for map and runs code uh, string to quoted on the code and sends back the status in the quote form. Originally, I thought the supervisor was overkill, but it turned out that once I started to check that the IDE could um, parse around errors, like an, you expect an IDE to do, you don't expect one error to screw up the syntax highlight of the rest of your file, that it would actually kill off the quoting server, and the gen server would just restart it, so it was great. The only thing I had to do is that JUnit can test so fast that I had to increase the um, number of um, process crashes per second to like 2,000 instead of the default five. In YEC, one has to repeat the pattern for coding the tail of the infix operations for each tail. So the pattern's short, but there's no indication in the code that that tuple of two arguments is the same for reasons. So it's almost like a magic number of, like, did the programmer intend this to be this way for all of them on purpose? In GrammarKit, I can have the nodes implement interfaces, as I said before, and then define methods for those interfaces. So I can more explicitly say that these quote the same way on purpose by having them do the same interface. Unfortunately, it's Java, so like constructing anything with J interface is so many more lines of code than the actual Erlang code would be. PSI element has an accept children's, so quoting a file just becomes a recursive action of quoting the things that are at the top level scope and just telling them to quote their children and so on. Finally, the top level, anytime you have multiple lines, is called a block. And so the Erlang in the native uh, parser is very simple. If it's one thing, it just doesn't become a list. If it is multiple things, it becomes this hidden double underscore block with the list. And I can do the same thing in Java, but once again with a lot more lines of code. 
The actual comparison just comes down to calling equals on the J interface objects, but there were some caveats because of how equals is implemented in J interface. From the basic type section of getting started guide for Elixir or just by messing around IX, we know that sometimes lists of numbers will render as a single quoted uh, care list. From this, we have a mental model that the care list is just formatting decision. A whole list of numbers is rendered as a care list if all the numbers are printable ASCII. There's even the trick of putting uh, zero on the end to make it unprintable if you want it to still look like a list. But the name care list is much more th than that. OTP Erlang string is only returned if all the numbers fit into a C care type of 0 to 255. And as far as I know, Jose and Robert Verding didn't even know this because I asked them, and they said it was just printable characters. This isn't just an artifact of J interface. The actual Erlang wire protocol uses a different tag, like a different um, piece of binary data on the wire to, to signal the difference between an Erlang string versus a generic list. It even goes so far to have a special tag for an empty list. Uh, the first bug I discovered was that the native tokenizer didn't handle a comment um, after a dot, but before the identifier correctly. Uh, for identifiers, this doesn't matter, but if the actual function is an operator name that's scoped to a module, this becomes a problem. In order to handle this in my parser, I just made comment uh, stay in the dot operation state. In the native parser, uh, Jose had to fix it by doing something similar, where if you see a comment, it just gets stripped. The only thing that separates an ambiguous parentheses and a parenthetical function call is the space between the identifier and the opening parenthesis. Worse, a space or no space between an identifier and opening square bracket is both valid, no space, and its bracket operation, which use the access protocol. A space and its list as an argument to a no parentheses call. So one space can have completely different meaning. It's even more important for brackets, where one is what used to be an access operation, and now I guess it's just a dick lookup, and the other way where it's a function taking a list. The Elixir tokenizer handles the no space and space situation by actually using a different atom to signify the uh, identifier. I didn't want to do that, so instead, I did a little trick that I didn't think that would work. I actually issued a token that represented no text. Uh, I just called this token call. And this way, I was able to match that there actually had been no space between the identifier and the um, opening brackets or open parentheses. Stabs contain the stab operator arrow that I was used to, stab and lambda, um, which is used to map anonymous function arguments in function clauses. They're also used in pattern matching in do blocks. But from the parser's perspective, stabs don't actually need a stab operator. They can just contain an expression, such as the first part of a try block. But that also means, since stabs can occur in parentheses, that any parenthetical group is a stab. So 1 plus 2 in parentheses is also a stab, which is weird because there's no stab in it. To get, a, to get a plane group, you just go through axis expression, you get the stab expression, you get the opening parenthesis, you get the expression itself, and then you get the closing parenthesis. The other part of stabs that I couldn't figure out was how any of the anonymous function clauses could have more than one line in their code because it only has a rule for expression. There is no expression list that blocks use. Um, so, but then I noticed that there was a pseudo expression list because the second rule for stabs is a stab can be a stab followed by EOL and a stab expression. So you just could get a bunch of EOL expressions on the end. But that still leaves the problem of those expressions aren't associated with the part before the stab, which is like the pattern match for the function clause. So this is where Yuck Grammar is a little sneaky. It doesn't actually build up a parse tree, a function clause at a time. Instead, the stab operation and plain expressions are all siblings, and the Erlang build stab function calls an access expression, merges all the adjacent expressions into the ch children of the prior stab operations until the next stab operation is hit. Like I said, I thought this was a dirty trick. 
to not have the grammar actually represent the AST. And I couldn't actually do it that way in uh, Java because the, the structure of the PSI tree is used for stuff like fine usage, so I couldn't rearrange it. Uh, this is one of those things where yak building the AST tree on its own is somewhat more helpful. So the key to making it work in grammar kit where the AST has to be directly is the negative look ahead in the stab body expression, which is the second line that says private. So all it does is it looks for is like, if this is the start of a stab expression, then I'm going to stop the current expression. So instead of grouping after the fact, it's constantly looking ahead. And if it hits another one, it's like, okay, I'll stop this one, group it together, and then I'll go on to the next one. Unmatched expressions get their name from the fact that the two operands in a binary expression don't have to be the same type, unlike a matched expression where they have to be the same type. The other important characteristic, and the one that everyone wanted, be, is because they contain do blocks. So up until this point, IntelliJ Elixir couldn't handle the most rudimentary um, Elixir module because it couldn't actually handle def module do end. Block expressions are what uh, are what would be expected from the previous parts of the grammar and the Elixir production code. Identifiers are function calls followed by a do block. Do blocks contain stab, which we've already covered. So the only thing new here is block list. Block list is, is a list of block items, which are block EOLs, which are block identifiers that can be followed by an optional stab. So what's a block identifier? So block identifiers are the keywords after, else, rescue, and catch. This means that those are real keywords in Elixir. So due to the power of macros, if we don't have if and unless as keywords, they're just identifiers, but the else inside an if or unless is a keyword. So we can't invent new keywords for Elixir. We can only rearrange them. So in theory, you could make some new macro that has more than one else. The dangling else problem is a problem with languages like C or Java that have an optional else when nesting. The problem can be resolved by either saying that the else binds to the outermost if or the closest if. This problem is also possible with do blocks in Elixir when resolving which function call a do block binds to. In an actual Elixir grammar, the do block always binds to the outermost function call, which turns out to be an easy choice for rightmost derivation parsers like Yuck, but for leftmost derivation parsers like GrammarKit, all the textbooks actually told me, don't do this, and then moved on to the next section. It was just like, yeah, don't do that. Choose the other way. It's easier. Um, but it turned out this was only a problem with LL1 type parsers, and grammar kit isn't an LL type 1 parser. LL1 means left to right, leftmost derivation with only one look ahead. But parsing expression grammars, as I showed, I can do as much look ahead as I want. When adding unmatched expressions to the Elixir BNF, I actually ended up taking matched expression out of the top level expression, which if you think about it, looks weird. Like, how do I get matched expressions anymore? Well, it turns out the important distinction is that unmatched expressions can either have blocks or not. But matched expressions have to never have blocks. Um, because to get the outermost binding, we want to say that the outermost function call takes a do block or not, but every one of the arguments to that function must not take a block or the, it screws with the syntax. So while in yet grammar, a block expression is a matched expression followed by a do block, in grammar kids grammar, a matched expression is an unmatched expression that can't have a block. Before releasing version uh, 1.0.0, I wanted to make sure that I hadn't missed some syntax that was valid, but I hadn't thought of when manually writing this that I hadn't thought of when manually writing the Elixir test cases. So I knew I couldn't write quick check rules for this because if I couldn't understand how to write the grammar once, writing it another time wasn't going to make it any better, and doing generative testing with quick check would require me to just write the grammar rules over again. So I decided to parse all of Elixir Lang Elixir as a test case. So I ended up did finding, I did find bugs in my grammar, but I also found bugs in the native tokenizer and parser again. The first one was with function captures. So function captures have four variants. You can capture a remote function where you have an alias and then a function and the arity. You can have a local function with the arity. But you can also have weird ones, like pipe pipe slash two, or uh, the actual word or slash two. It turns out that the word or one has an error in uh, before Elixir 1.1. While the reference syntax does end up coding just like division, I ended up needing to have a special handling for the 
to be able to lex it as an operator because point it out as just like an or operator made the parser super confusing and it was just too much to handle. So I actually do just say it is an operator token, unlike the other rules. And I can just do this in one rule because I have regular expressions handy. To fix it in Elixir, uh, John Isaac Stone uh, just defined a new uh, Erlang macro to look for the operator keywords and then check those as keywords, but only if there's a capture operation. So in my version, I looked ahead, I looked ahead and saw if there was a slash. In his version, he checked instead behind and see if there was a capture. The third bug I discovered had to do with piping blocks. So surprisingly, there was only one case in the Saren library that actually did this. So if people had like stylistically said, we will never pipe blocks, this would never have been caught. So the problem is, is that if you have non-block matched expressions and you pipe them, the associativity is maintained. But if you start with a block and then pipe, it makes it look that the pipe operator is right associative. So you see, we're using pipes everywhere, so it's kind of hard to understand. But look at the line number. It should be that line three pipe happens first, and that one and two are piped together before three is piped on the end. But when, it's, when one takes a block, then instead, two and three will be piped together, and then one will be piped to that group. So I wasn't actually sure. I, I just assumed like the not in, that I had missed some Erlang post-processing for this. Uh, but Jose Valim actually confirmed that it was a bug in the native parser. Um, because of the way the rules are written in Yak, it didn't actually look far enough to find the best match. And so it screwed up the associativity. So because I use a different class of parser that doesn't do reduce and shift operations, I was able to stumble upon this bug. Having more test cases, because I didn't trust my own understanding of the original grammar and how to translate to grammar kit, also let me find the other bugs. So an alt alternative implementation um, is a good way to ensure that the tokenizer and parser for language has covered all the edge cases. One year, 1,356 commits, three, three bugs in native Elixir, and the parser was complete. And I'm only 12 minutes over. <laughs>